I literally did um, on the day it was finished. Yeah. I thought, you know, uh, and when it was due, and it was, I mean, dirt music was already being advertised, and it, you know, it was going coming in blah blah in whatever month it was. It had a title. It had a price. Um, it, you know, a publisher had, had built you know a schedule. People's jobs were it felt to me on the line and. There I was wrapping it up to send it off, um, and then sort of slowly realising that I hated it, that, I, that I, it wasn't ready. I had a manuscript, but not a novel. Somewhere in the manuscript was the novel that I wanted to write, or was trying to write. And I knew that if I parceled it up and sent it off, you know, it would get by, it would get published. and. Um, and in a way, it felt like a moral decision, you know. Um, can I can I let this one go, or should I get it right, you know? And then realising, well, I've only got days, you know, to get it right. And then, anyway, my wife came home at the end of the day. She'd left me when I'm sort of wrapping this thing up to send off, and she gets home at the end of the day, and I'm still wrapping it and unwrapping it and wrapping it. <laughs> and she could just tell by this sort of sick look on my face that um, something serious was up. And um, she just said, you know, sagely, um, well, why don't you sleep on it? And really, for all the sleep I got that night, I could have actually literally just put the damn thousand pages on the bed and just tried to sleep on it, literally on top of it, because I, I, I did the whole tossing and turning routine, and I just got up in the middle of the night I'd rung later in the day, that day before I went to sleep, I'd rung and said, look, how many days have we got? You know, what's the production schedule? How long before, you know, the pillars of stone, you know, start falling over? You know, how I felt like I was eyeless in Gaza. <laughs> Samson bringing down everything on his own head. Um, and I said, well, you know, you've got, um, we've got next month, really, and then, and then maybe we can, we can snitch a couple of extra days. So I, I got up in the middle of the night, anyway. Rode to work in the dark, on me, on me pushy, um, sharp and... You don't work at home? No, I, of, I often work elsewhere, because yeah. people come knocking on the door, yeah. even, even if, eventually people come and find me. Yeah. And, um, got on the pushy in the dark, um, the manuscript on the, on the carrier, um, went up to, the, up to where I work, sharpened a box of pencils, um, put the manuscript down and started again. And, um, you wrote longhand? Mm. And I wrote, I wrote the whole thing back out, you know, by hand with a pencil and just started again from, from the beginning. And I, I, I worked and worked and worked. I went for hours and hours and hours that night. And when I sort of, um, when I just realised, you know, that I couldn't go on any longer. It was dark again, I think, and um, I used to just keep riding to and from work. And eventually, I just didn't know what day it was or what time. You know, what, it was dark all the time. I'd just ride home to and from in the dark um, without my helmet. You know, like a true rebel. You know, Australians. Australians are sort of culture. Australians the sort of culture that you know, uh, you know, the most rebellious, scary thing you can do is r ride a push bike without your helmet. You know, ooh wow. Uh, Anyway, uh, at the end of this 55 days and nights, I, you know, I'd completely rewritten the, the book. I'd, I'd, I'd reimagined it in a, in a sense. And so, how many words was that? Oh, I don't know. It was um, it was about that high. I think when I started, and it was about that high when I when I finished. It was I probably it was probably half as long. Um, so there were hundreds of pages, you know, that that I cut out. You know, most of it was good prose. It just wasn't the right write prose for the story, you know, and uh, so that was a bit painful. And I, I've t told this story before, but, you know, I finally figured out how you, um, you know, that the, the kind of the, the analogy that's in uh, how does a rich man get into heaven, you know, and, and he has about the same chance as, you know, getting a camel through the eye of a needle, you know, and, um, but I figured out how you do get a camel through the eye of a needle. First, you've got to shoot your camel. And you make a fire, and then you boil the camel, and you spit it through the eye of the needle, <laughs> and that's what it felt like to me afterwards. In retrospect, I was so, I was in so much 
turmoil and I was so angry with myself and angry with this book and angry with the world that I just ha hadn't been able to get it right and I was scared and whatever else and I just boiled this thing down literally with a pencil and, and, a, and a hot frightened mind and yeah I shot my camel, had to kill it first, shot my book, just rendered it and then spat it you know, angrily through this little <laughs> little needle eye. And, and it gives me no joy to remember because it was just, it was the most gruesome experience. Were, were you conscious, were you conscious when you, when you were in this last phase of it? Did you know as you were writing it that you had it? No, I knew that this was all I could do. I knew this was my last shot. Oh. And, and I, I was, I was trying to stay sane. Uh, during the process, and I was, uh, I was so angry that um, it was weird. I don't know what I, I think it was just fear and fury that, that that got me through. But and I, when I finished it, I knew it was better. I didn't know if it was any good, and and in the end, I just thought, well, you know, you don't finish books. You just you leave off. You know, you just leave well enough alone. You, 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 and in the end, you have to just accept the fact that it's only a book. Um, and it's hard for me, someone like me, to say it's only a book, because you know books are my life, books are my recreation, books are my living, um, books are the you know the one of the great vehicles of culture. You know I'm reverent about books, but in the end, even for me, eventually, it's only a book, and I'm not going to break myself on the wheel of the book. Um, Can you foresee a time in your life when you won't write? I've never been able to say yes to that, um, but I would rather n not write than, than than write badly. Um, you know, I, I I would hope that I didn't have to be tapped on the shoulder, as they say in football. You know, you know, mate, it's been great. <laughs> you know, it's uh, you, you've. You've done. You've soldiered on. You've been of good service to the club, but uh, don't you think it might be? And you know, us and the rest of the team and the board, we've had a bit of a chat, and you know. So who knows? I, I, I hope I can. I hope I can recognise that, and I hope there'll be people around me, um, brave and honest enough to say, you know what, you know. This one isn't any good, and the last one wasn't any good, and the stuff that we can see that you're working on now doesn't promise much. So you know, why don't you just let it ride for a while? You know. Mm. To be perfectly honest, given how hard I've worked for so long from such a young age, and the fact that it does take a toll on your mind and on your body, um, it's not a non-contact sport. You know, it's not a it's not an abstract. Um, pursuit. Um, really, if I couldn't do it anymore, there's other things I like doing in the world um, that would console me, you know. I'd still, if I couldn't write anymore, I'd, I'd, I'd know that I'd had a good run, that I'd, that I'd written a few decent books, that, that they'd been well regarded, that, that they, for a while at least, had been um, respected and some of them even treasured in the culture that I was a part of. And I think, well, damn, I had a great run, mm. you know. Um, and I'd still have reading. I still mm. you know, prefer to read than to write. And then I'd think, well, particularly if I was still young enough, you know, to have enough, you know, if I was bodily fit enough to um, cope with it, it's, I'd just like to be out there in the, in the world more, you know. I'd, I think, I mean, I might be just completely kidding myself, but if I couldn't write, I think I could still live. And you couldn't have, I couldn't have even contemplated that 20 years ago. What is it people, the general public, understand least about what you do? How hard it is, yeah. I mean, how, how frightening it can be. Um, and, and how little control you have over it. Not, not in the romantic sense of, you know, you smoke opium and you channel the ghost of Percy Shelley, you know. Um, it's just that, um, particularly if you start young, you are literally growing up in public. Whatever you do 
is on the record. It's out there and you can't take it back. And most people's lives, you know, if they disgrace themselves in their form of employment, their work colleagues and their boss and maybe a few clients know. And it's shaming and embarrassing. And, but it's quite a small pool of people. If, um, if I do bad work, if I, you know, if I disgrace myself, I can't, I can't, I can't call it in. You know, mm. I can't, re I can't reclaim, and it's out yeah. there, and I, I know, and they know, and it's, it's in the archive. You yeah. know, and that's that public aspect. Given that you are literally spending most of your life in a room, as I've said on a number of occasions, in a room with people who don't exist. Yeah. Um, the public consequences of, of that transaction, which, you know, is a mysterious transaction to me even even now. You know, I, I know technically how to write, uh, and I'm brave enough now to say in middle age that I think I'm not bad at it. Um, but I don't, you know, there's a kind of a mystery to it that um, amazes me and frightens me a little bit in the sense of, you know, you don't really know where that wave's coming from, mm. um, and what event over the horizon is, has caused that, you know, that energy that you are essentially riding when you're, because um, really the act of riding for me, when it's when it's most pleasurable, is is um, is um, about momentum, yeah. and if you have momentum as a as a rider, then you you're, you're okay, you're travelling, mm. it's mm. it's going, and, mm. if, and it's achieving momentum that's the, that's the hard bit. Mm. Um, Anyway. Do you have one book, I mean, how many novels have you written now? Do you know? I think this is novel eight, or there's 20 books, I think. Oh, 20 books? Yeah. Novel eight? I thought it was more than that. Yeah, well, there's, you know, three books of stories and, mm. I don't know, five or six books for, 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 for um, adolescents and children. Okay. I think it's 20 books. So do you have a, a which of, do you have a book you look back on with particular fondness? No, I have passages that I look back on with fondness. For I, example? Oh, I can't think of one, and I, and I wouldn't anyway. Uh, um, um, I mean, obviously there are books that I'm especially fond of, you know, because they put my children through school and kept the wolf from the door and, you know. So a book like Cloud Street, in, you know, in, in, for instance, you know, um, saved our bacon, you know, um, at a time when we were, we were broke. And, you know, I just spent my 20s writing a book every year for you know, roughly the equivalent of a thousand bucks a year. I mean, I used to get something like a thousand dollars as an advance, you know, on a year or a year or, two, year or two's work. And um, I was just, I was working hard and just, you know, and I was happy, but um, you're afraid a lot of that time, you know, of the landlord and the bank and whatever. So you, Cloud Street, dug us out of a big hole and and so I have a particular fondness for being, that was the sort of the strange, um, dishevelled, chaotic cavalry that came over the hill and saved us. So even if it wasn't in the end, you know, a, a, a particularly good book, if I looked back late in life and thought, well, that was a dud, you know, it was the, you know, if it turns out to be this, the, the case, then it's the dud that saved us in a, in a, you know, in a sense. How um, do you explain its popularity, by which I mean, how do you explain the resonance it got in the culture? Well, I don't. That's other people's job to explain that. You don't have um, an idea about it? I don't think I can account for it. I mean, it's, it was literally, I mean, you know, I've told the story before and people have to forgive me if they've heard it 5,000 times, but it's true. It was 4,000 copies printed in paperback. It was supposed to be a hardback and then we had, we were just going to that kind of recession that we had to have. Um, so we, we faced the reality that people just weren't, weren't going to buy a hardcover book. And it was a fattish sort of book and um, uh, 4,000 copies and we just, you know, we would, we just hoped that, you know, we'd sell a few. And the 4,000 were gone before the week was out, I think, and they'd reprint, they re went, we went back to, to the press, or the publishers went back and pressed the button for another 2,000 copies, and <laughs> they were gone by Wednesday, and they pushed the button again for another two, and then they, eventually 
we all got the message that something was up and they started reprinting in, in, in proper numbers and right. um, and it just it went off it was nobody could I mean, we were all looking at each other it was rolling our eyes like what the you know you got any idea nah you know and and then you got to a point where we I were too not. frightened we were too frightened to um, to question it you know don't let's not try and analyze it because we will <laughs> We'll, you know, we'll we'll figure it out and 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 it will stop. Then yeah. it just kept going and going and going and and you know, I was it was a it's a peculiar book, I guess, and it's I think it's a literary book, um, and it was certainly writ written from a literary sensibility. I mean, it was never written with any the faintest hope of being a bestseller, um, or with a f the faintest hope of being a book that you know became special to as many people as it seems to have become for whatever reasons. And I don't really understand the reasons. Mm. Um, and I hope they're not bad reasons, you know. I hope, it, you know, if I don't find out later in life because it, that it's appealed to some latent streak of fascism in the, <laughs> in the culture that just needed to be fed at the time. Um, some people have intimated um, from on high that it sort of tapped into a kind of um, uh, an infantile uh, nostalgia, um, and that that explains its success. And it might be true. I, I I don't know. The kinds of people who come up to me and want to talk about it um, don't seem to be preoccupied by nostalgia, particularly mm. when they're 15 or mm. 17. Mm. Um, they don't know the world of the book mm. any more than I did. Mm. Um, so it's a, it's a mystery to me, I mean it's a happy one. Well, I think, I think there's, a, there's a quality, a special quality of Australian existentialism about you, particularly in your support of the Fremantle Football Club. <laughs> so I want you to explain, explain the character of the Fremantle Football Club to me. Why are they like they are? I don't know, I mean um, it's, it's 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 a mystery beyond art. I think <laughs> it's 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 safe to say. I mean, we love them and we suffer them, and they're you know they're a, they're a special breed. I think what happened was, in retrospect, looking you know now that I get a chance to think about it, Fitzroy left a great vacuum in in AFL. Um, As in a, a great character walked off the stage. Yeah, but also you know it was a great vacuum there of a, of, the, of a great tragedy, you know, and everything else sort of seemed to be um, just this sort of general corporatised success. So we needed, you know, we needed, we needed a suffering um, scapegoat, you know, it's almost as though, um, it's almost as though Fremantle is, is that donkey in, um, in that Robert Bresson film, um, Balthazar, the, the, the poor suffering beast who just travels through the, the, the story of various people's lives being flogged and beaten and disrespected and um, mocked, and um, and yet you you stay with you stay with this poor you know poor donkey. And I, I think in a way um, now that the Fitzroy Football Club is gone and that you know endless losing streak and the the, the, the sorrow and the pity is uh, is gone. It just Fremantle just stepped into the shoes. It was a perfect segue, you know. And they have a community which is. Um, Probably, you know, reminiscent of the old of the old Fit Fitzroy um, supporters community. It's you know they love their football. They they are no strangers to suffering. It's an old working class town. They're used to being ignored and disrespected, particularly by the the pastel suburban types who who follow um, West Coast, um, which doesn't actually represent a community. It just represents um, a class, an aspiration. Um, you know, it's it's you know it's Fountain Gate, it's Burragoon, it's Carousel. You know, um, it's you know it's 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 a yeah they 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 stand for a shopping mall. You know, and like shopping malls, they're one you've seen one you've seen them all. They're not a place. They're just they're sort of a, they're a replication of a place. Anyway, Fre Fremantle, you know, is a still a town where you can see the players train. You see them in the street, um, and they have to wear it. You know, they wear the glory and they wear the, the you know, the, the dishonour um, and, it's, and it's hard on them. But, you know, there's a sort of team where you clap them off when they lose, you know. Standing ovation. 
I was there the first training session, you know. I was there when, you know, that little mighty little dynamo Peter Bell ran out. You know, you think, God, who's the water boy, you know? Mm. And, I mean, there are characters like him who are just huge-hearted, toiling, um, wonderful, you know, players, you know, who just give it everything for so little reward, you know? And if, in the end, love is all they get from their community and their supporters, along with all the other kind of dyspeptic um, advice that they get um, <laughs> from the community, then uh, may that maybe that's all that they get, you know, maybe that's enough for them. I, 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 but it must be really tough, you know? I mean, you've got, on paper, a great football team, um, you know, except maybe for a, a, a few midfield issues, but um, we have sort of the genius of recruitment, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Tra trading now that's sort of interplanetary. <laughs> I don't know. I love them. I just love them. I've still got the best team song. Oh, everybody wow. hates it, but I, I, I love it. Every other team song just sounds like a sort of a sort of a knees up Mother Brown from 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 previous eras. You know, we've got a backbeat. You know. <laughs> now I was going to ask you to finish. Um, I'm a great lover of the start of Cloud Street, mm -hmm. and um, to me it's. It's got something of um, Dylan Thomas's Under Milk Wood, which I love also. I've heard Dylan Thomas read Under Milk Wood. I've never heard you read The Start of Cloud Street. Is that right? Yeah. It's, like, it's like an unsigned copy. I mean, it's a rare, rare person who hasn't heard me read it. Is that right? I'm, I think I've been inflicted upon every soul <laughs> in the country, haven't I? Hey, I'll read it if you yeah, want. Just, you're a cheap night out. I have to get uh, some glasses, though. Yeah? Now, because age has wearied me. And the year's probably condemned, but... Will you look at us by the river? The whole restless mob of us on spread blankets and the dreamy, briny sunshine, skylarking and shyacking about for one day, one clear, clean, sweet day in a good world in the midst of our living. Yachts run before an unfelt gust with bag-necked pelicans riding above them, the city, their twitching backdrop, all blocks and points of mirror light down to the water's edge. Twenty years, they all say, sprawling and drinking. There's ginger beer, stagger juice and hot flasks of tea. There's pasties, a ham, chicken legs and a basket of oranges, potato salad and dried figs. There are things spilling from jars and bags. The speech is silenced by a melodious belch which gets big applause. Someone blurts on a baby's belly and a song strikes up. Unless you knew, you'd think they were a whole group. An earthly vision, because look, even the missing are there, the gone and the taken are there with them in the shade pools of the peppermints by the beautiful, the beautiful, the river. And even now, one of the here is leaving. Beautiful. Thank you very much, man. Cheers, man.